Good evening. I'm excited because it's another opportunity we have to be together. I'm also excited because we uh, are having another question and answer session, but maybe I'm just not too good at answering questions. I don't know. Last time I only could get through one question. Tonight we're only going to get through one question. But the question is one of great importance. I'm also excited tonight because we have uh, Ben and Misty with us, and I'm excited for them. I remember uh, a few years ago how excited and nervous and scared and, and all those emotions wrapped up in one, and, and I'm excited for them because they're about to begin what I know they'll look back and say is the best two years of their life. And I know that they will love you so much because you're going to have a part in it. Uh, we have also visiting with us this evening a family from the Bethel congregation over in Martin. And uh, Bethel was a congregation that supported me while we were in Bear Valley. And I could, uh, I could spend 30 minutes up here at least telling you stories about uh, all the times that we've been with them and how much we love them and appreciate them. But uh, we're, we're grateful for Ben, for Misty, and uh, wish them Godspeed in their work. You know, sometimes things surprise us, don't they? When we think about the idea of the question for tonight, and the question is the one that you see on the screen, simply put, how could God forgive me? I, I think it was uh, more worded along this line on the piece of paper that was in the, the box in the back. You know, I've done some things in my life that I'm not proud of. I was involved in things in the military that I'm not I'm proud of, that I'm ashamed of. And, and after all I've done, sometimes I struggle with how could God forgive me of all that I've done wrong in my life. And I think if we were honest, we would all so say that sometimes we thought that. Sometimes things happen that, that we don't plan, that we don't intend. Sometimes we do things because of negligence. Sometimes we just don't care and we do the wrong thing. But it's always a shock. When we look back and realize what we've done that was wrong, isn't it? You know, Friday night, I was, uh, this is confession time, okay? I'm going to move away from the podium and confess. The elders don't know about this. They're fidgeting a little bit right now, probably. Friday night, I was at home cooking supper. And uh, I was startled with a, on the back door. I mean an authoritative. And I went to the back door and I opened it and I was even more surprised to find a Henry County Sheriff's Deputy standing on my back porch. He said, are you Mr. Sawyers? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> he said, did you buy gas this afternoon? I said, yes, sir. Did you pay for the gas this afternoon? I thought I did. He said, well, you were called in as uh, someone who drove off without paying for your gas. Well, we had heard about Miss Sue Friday afternoon, and, and we had taken off to go see her. They'd already discharged her from the hospital, so we ran by the store up here on the corner, and, and uh, I got a little gas and put it in my truck, and I, I waited for the receipt to spit out, and it didn't, and I didn't want to take time to walk in. We were going to go to her house and see her, so I just jumped in the truck and took off. It didn't spit a receipt out because when I swiped my card, it didn't read my card. And the guy called me in as stealing gas. I'm sure that's not what the elders was expecting when they hired me. Because <laughs> that was the reputation I was going to earn in Paris. But, but I explained to the officer what happened and he kind of laughed and he, I said, and I threw in the fact, I'm the new preacher at Eastwood Church of Christ. <laughs> I don't know if that was the right thing to say or not, but anyway. He said, well, he said, you know, we have these people that we routinely go to their house about this. And usually when it's somebody like you, you know, it's just an accident. And he said, can you take care of that by tomorrow? And I said, we'll take care of it right now. And so Melody, while I was continuing to cook supper, Melody jumps in the truck. She drives back up here to Little General. The guy is celebrating behind. My driveway came back. My driveway came back. <laughs> I don't know if they have to pay for it or what's the deal. But uh, anyway, she explained. He said, it's no big deal. She paid. And the debt was taken care of. See, even though I messed up, I didn't mean to. But I tell you, when that officer was on my back porch, I felt about that tall. 
that there was a way out of that, wasn't there? To admit the problem and to accept what I had done wrong and take the necessary steps to get over it. In our relationship with the Lord, there's always going to be times when we mess up. We're going to stumble. We're going to fall. We're going to leave undone things we ought to be doing. We're going to do things that we should not do. We're going to make mistakes sometimes. We don't even realize we've made the mistake until an officer knocks on your door while you're cooking supper. But can God forgive us? You know, this uh, sign that's on the, the screen there comes from, or was inspired by Psalm 103 and verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. You know, it's significant that he did not say as far as the north is from the south. Because if we take off walking north, we can eventually find the place that's the end of north, right? That north pole. We can go south and we can find the end. And we can measure from the, the north to the south. And we can see how far that distance is. You start walking east and when do you get all the way east? You never get there, right? And you take off walking west and you keep walking and you'll never reach west. As far as the east from the west. In other words, completely separated. Completely taken away. How is it that that can happen? Well, if you'll open up your Bibles this evening to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is what we're going to be looking at this evening. I mentioned to our class in the auditorium this morning as we began looking at lament psalms. We looked at Psalm 73 in our class this morning. I made mention that we were going to study another lament psalm this evening. And this is the one. Psalm 51 is a lament psalm. It is also a penitent psalm or a psalm of repentance. But it is a lament psalm. Now 73 that we studied this morning is Asaph lamenting the fact that he doesn't understand how the wicked can prosper and, and the righteous do not. Psalm 51 is lamenting an even greater problem. David is lamenting his sin. And, and we have the insight of knowing that Psalm 51 was written in response to what Garrett read for us a few minutes ago from 2 Samuel chapter 12. After he had committed the sin that David committed with Bathsheba of, of adultery. After he had Uriah, her son, murdered. He was guilty of adultery and murder. And after Nathan came to him and, and tells him this story about the man who had one little lamb and his neighbor who had a whole flock who stole that lamb. And, and as David's hearing that, he gets angrier and angrier. And, and he says, that guy's got to pay. And Nathan says, you're the man. That's what we see in 2 Samuel 12. And we see Nathan tell him that there's going to be a punishment your life won't be taken away, but the child's life will. And as we continue to read there in 2 Samuel, you'll see that, that David will fast and he will put on sackcloth and ashes and, and all these things after the child is born until it dies. And then he'll rise and he'll take a, a shower, he'll clean himself, put on fresh clothes and eat. And so we see what he does, but what is he thinking? How does a man of God... Deal with sin. That's what we've talked about in our, our Sunday morning class about Psalms. Is that, you know, the, the Psalms give us insights of how a man of God deals with certain things in their life. How they allow that to draw them closer to God. So how does a man of God deal with sin? If we deal with it the way a man of God should, God not only can, but promises to forgive us. And that's what we see in Psalm 51. So as we examine this, there's four points in your outline that we want to look at. The first is kind of an overview idea, and then we'll look, get into the text with points two, three, and four. First of all, it's important for us to stay, understand that failure is not fatal. Failure is not fatal. Yeah, but if you knew what kind of sins I committed, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but if you knew what I had done wrong, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but if, if you could just imagine the things that I've seen and done and said and thought and, 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 and done to other people, it doesn't matter. Because failure does not have to be fatal. Now, this particular psalm, Psalm 51, has to be one of the most heartfelt, most moving prayers for forgiveness in all the Bible. And, and when you think about what David has done, 
the adultery and the murder. And as we examine things, we say, boy, that's two of the really bad ones, right? Of course, as God looks at it, there's not really bad ones and not so bad ones. But even as we would look at it, we would say, you know, this is a man after God's own heart. Look at what he did. How could God hold him in such an esteemed position? It was not because of the failure, but the way that he handled the failure. He did not allow it to be something that was fatal for him. How did David feel after Nathan said, you're the man? What was it that a man after God's own heart recognized? Well, he recognized that God was the only one that had the cure for what was wrong. You know, he could have just as easily become hard-hearted. He could have just as easily given up and said, I can't do it. He could have just as easily run away and, and tried to blame. He didn't do any of those things. A man of God understands that failure is not fatal. He simply must deal with sin in a positive way, like David demonstrates in this psalm. So secondly... What are the progression that, what's the progression that we see? What are the steps that are necessary for us to understand from Psalm 51? Well, first of all, as we begin looking at the text in verses 1 through 5, we see stage 1 in, uh, in the sin that David committed and, and what goes on in this situation was the failure. In verses 1 through 5. First of all, reading there in Psalm 51 in verse 1, it says, He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness." According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. We talked about this morning how that in the Lament Psalms, there's always an opening that appeals to God. And especially in, in the situation that we see here, the only person, the only one, the only entity that David could turn to was God. And he recognizes in verse 1 that it was his fault. You know, there's something... Uh, often lost in Christianity today, and that's a deep sense of hurt and mourning over sin, over wrongdoing. But spiritual people, men of God and women of God, take sin very seriously and do not quickly dismiss it when we know that we're guilty. David recognizes it's not God's fault that I've sinned. It's not, it's not anything that God owes us when we're talking about His forgiveness. I don't deserve his forgiveness. I'm begging him for it because I'm the one that's failed. A man of God recognizes his failure. We're indeed beggars before God. In verse 2, he says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He was dirty. How does David feel when, when Nathan says, You're the man? He felt dirty. He wanted to be thoroughly washed. You know, David isn't concerned with just the sin. He's not concerned with just the fact that he got caught. David's worried about his character. About the sinful character that, that led him to that. It's not just what he's done, but why he's done it. He wants that washed away. In verse 3, he blamed no one else. He says, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. David is not concerned about Bathsheba. He's focusing completely on upon himself. He could have reasoned with God, well, she was the one out there in the wide open, right? He could have, like Adam did, this woman that you gave me, or like Eve, well, the serpent, he didn't try to blame someone else. He says, it's my sin. I messed up. A man of God blames no one else. Doesn't make excuses. Doesn't try to shift the blame to someone else. Instead, he understood that he was the one that did it. And he understood that he had done it against God. Verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. How many people today would have even thought about anything about what David actually did? How many, how many television shows and how many movies are centered around the idea of adultery and murder? You know what, he's, it's no big deal. David said it is a big deal because ultimately he knew his wrongdoing was against God. He, it's not that, that he doesn't recognize he sinned against Bathsheba. It's not that he doesn't recognize that he sinned against Uriah. It's not that he doesn't recognize that he sinned against all of Israel with, for whom he was supposed to be the king and the leader. 
But ultimately, what made his sin so grave was that he had sinned against God. He knows that he's guilty and knows that he deserves whatever it would be that God wants to do to him. If God chooses to punish him, then God's just in doing so. And then he says in verse 5 that he's worthless. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now that's the way the New King James Version renders that verse. And no matter which translation that you're reading out of, however it's translated, there's always a little bit of difficulty with us that we're trying to explain what it means. This is a controversial verse, to say the least, because there are many that will try to take this verse and say that this means that he was condemned with sin. He was guilty of sin from the time that he was conceived. Before he was ever born, he was a, a sinner. Those who would preach Calvinism or teach Calvinism or, or things of this nature will often look at this verse. But that's not what he's saying. This is a, a great example of poetic expression. Those of you that are in the Psalms class on Sunday mornings, you remember us talking about at the very beginning of the, the, the class and the introduction material, how that this is poetic expression. And there's exaggeration at times. And that's what he's saying. We might say it this way. I've been no counting worthless my whole life. I've been no counting worthless since the day I was born. That's what he's saying. Now, if you write in your Bibles, and I hope you do, out there beside Psalm 51 and verse 5, write down Psalm 22, verses 9 and 10. Psalm 22, verses 9 and 10. Because there's a great contrast that we see in Psalm 22, 9 and 10 from Psalm 51 and 5. In Psalm 51 and verse 5, David says, I've been worthless since birth. But in Psalm 22, verses 9 and 10, he says that, since I was a baby, I've trusted in God. Since I was in the womb, I have had a right relationship with the Lord. Now, what's the difference? Well, in Psalm 22, David feels good about his standing before God and his relationship with God. In Psalm 51, he doesn't. See, he understands that he's failed. And because of that... He's been brought low. He has that godly sorrow that leads to repentance. He has that, that poor in spirit that Jesus talks about at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. Because he understands his failure. Now, there's a bunch of passages here on the screen, and I'll be glad to share any of them with you later on. We're not going for time's sake go and look at them. But the number of passages that disproves the idea that you're born in sin are too numerous for us to spend time tonight to examine all. For example, Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 tells us that each individual is responsible for his own sin. The father's not responsible for the sin of the son. The son's not responsible for the sin of the Father. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, he says that God's willing that all should come to salvation. How's that possible if some are hopelessly and beyond their control in sin? That should say 2 Peter 3 9. It just says Peter 3 9. But 2 Peter 3 9, God's not slack concerning his promise, but is long suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How's that possible? And on and on we could go. If you get all the way down to the last two, one of the things that we see as we examine scriptures, we notice that there's never a time when an infant was baptized, nor was there ever a time when an infant was told to be baptized. In Mark 16, <clears throat> excuse me, in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, he says that the, the one who believes is subject to baptism. In Acts 2.38, he says baptism is for those who repent. And so we would know that an infant cannot do any of those. So this idea of us being born into sin is one that certainly does not align itself with Scripture. But the first thing that the man of God does is he understands, I failed God. I sinned. Not anybody else. It was me. I can't blame it on anyone else. It's not God's fault. It's not Bathsheba's fault. It's not anybody else's. It's my fault. I've made a mistake. I messed up. And God is the only person, the only one, the only entity that has the cure for me. So stage one is the failure. Stage two that we see in Psalm 51 is the fixing. 
And we see that in verses 6 through 12. The fixing for his sin. He needs a lot of things from God, is what he says. First of all, in verse 6, he needs God's perspective. In verse 6, it says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom. He wants the spirit. He wants the attitude. He wants the disposition within himself to be converted. He wants to see things from God's perspective. David hasn't had the proper view of God's wisdom. He's been doing things his way. And he says, I want to look at it from your perspective and see my sin as I should. See myself as I should. See my relationship with you as I should. It's when we go and look at things from God's perspective, just like class this morning, Asaph did in Psalm 73. When we go and look at things from God's perspective and get his vantage point, then we can see the steps that are necessary for cleansing. So he needs God's perspective, but he also does need God's cleansing. In verse 7, He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. David knows God's great forgiving nature is able to make him as pure and as clean as possibly he can be. He knows he's black and defiled and and dirty with sin. We talked about earlier how that he recognized how dirty he was with sin. But he knows the greatness of God's love and he knows God's forgiving nature. God can make him white. That is, he can make him free for sin. He needs God's joy. In verse 8, he says, Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. He wants to know again that, that any wrongdoings he's committed have been taken away. Sin not only separates us from God, in so doing it separates us from the only true source of joy. And that's a relationship with him. You know, they, Satan is giving us a faulty Bill of sale, isn't he? He's telling us that if if you'll just follow this, if you'll just try this, if you'll just do this, you'll be happy. It'll be great. And there's some pleasure in it. Certainly, Hebrews 11 tells us that. But it doesn't last for just a little bitty short time. And then there's no joy. And there's no happiness. And if one is really concerned about being righteous, then sin makes the heart sad. How many folks today are really bothered by sin? David describes it as, you've broken my bones. I can't even stand. But I need your joy, he says. In verse 9, he knows that's only possible with God's forgiveness. He says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. He realizes that God knows what he's done. To try to act like he does it, to try to... To sidestep what he's done. To try to to make excuses. To try to to get around it. Would be futile. You know we can fool people. And we can trick people. And we can twist the story. Yeah that's what happened. But let me tell you why that happened. We can't do that with God can we? And so it's foolishness for a man of God. Even try to lie or to hide from God. And he doesn't. Since God is all knowing. He, he appeals to him for the forgiveness that only God can give. When God blots out David's sins, he hides his face from those sins. In other words, they're gone. He remembers them no more. Yeah, but I, it doesn't matter. But you don't understand what I've, it doesn't matter. Even with what David's done, they're remembered no more. He hides them from him. He gives us renewal. Verse 10, David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David needs himself to be renewed. He views himself as being so wicked that he he wants to be created anew. He doesn't want God to just fix what he has. He wants him to create a brand new being, a brand new heart. One that would be clean. One that would be strong. He doesn't want to vacillate between righteousness and unrighteousness. I want to start again walking with you. Living for you. Serving you. And put all those other things behind me. And that's the only way he can have God's approval. Verse 11. He says, do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. God's appeal to God is wanting to have a a relationship of worship. In order to be in the presence of God, he knows that he needs to enjoy 
God's forgiveness. And so we ask for God's help in verse 12. Restore to, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. He recognizes the joys of God's salvation. And he has a willing spirit to do the things that God would have him to do. Stage two is the fixing. Stage one is the failure and he recognizes I'm the one that messed up. I'm the one that made a mistake. Stage two is the fixing where he says, God, you're the only one that can solve this problem. So whatever you want me to do, I'm yours. Just forgive me. And then in stage three, we see the fixing. Now, you know, I told Jeff Figarelli that when your preacher uses the DeLorean to symbolize the future, you know you got a cool preacher, you know. This is an even brighter future than in Back to the Future, though, isn't it? Notice what he says beginning in verse 13. This future that he has. He says he'll be evangelistic. Recognizing my troubles and the problems and, the, and what I've done. Recognizing that you're the one that can fix that and you will. He says in verse 13, because of that, I'm going to be evangelistic. I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners shall be converted to you. In other words, what he says is, I'm going to use this to teach others how they can solve their sin problem. That if they'll be a man of God and admit I've done wrong and, and I want to fix it and turn to you and you alone, that it can be fixed. I'm going to teach others about that. He knows how great his sin was. And so he knows how great is God's forgiveness. In verse 14, he says, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. David cannot speak to others until his own personal problem is resolved. But after that, once he's been delivered, since he's been forgiven, he says that there will be no restraint in me proclaiming God's goodness. You think about, for example, Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Who considered him to be the chief, himself to be the chief of sinners. And when the Lord came to him and said, go in the city and there to be told. And there Ananias told him, what are you waiting on? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And he did. And then Paul said, I went on to labor more abundantly than they all. Why? He recognized the debt that he owed. That he couldn't pay. That was paid for him. And he wanted to tell everybody about it. And he says, I'll worship you. Verse 15 through 17. Oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. You do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, oh God, you will not despise. How can God open his lips? By forgiving his sins. There was no sacrifice that he could make that would take away his sins. How, how many goats, how many calves, how many sheep, how many doves would he have to sacrifice to take away the sin of adultery? There weren't enough, was there? How many would he have to offer to take away the sin of murder? There wasn't enough, was there? The only sacrifice that would take that away is the sacrifice that God made for him in Jesus. And so that sacrifice is what God desires. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. That's what He wants from us. Not arrogance. Not self-justifying. Not ignorance of sin. David is throwing himself on the mercy of God. And he says, because I'm receiving it, there's going to be no end to me telling everyone about you. In verses 18 and 19, he says, Do good. In your good pleasure design, build the walls of Jerusalem. While I'm thinking about worshiping you, you know, we've got things we're trying to accomplish in Jerusalem and we want you to bless that. And then in verse 19, he says, Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they shall offer bulls on your altar. God is reminded, or me, David is reminded again about the fact that God does want him even though there's no sacrifices to take away the sin, he wants David to worship him. And he says, I'm going to. So what's the point of all this? There's, there's the, the idea that we talked about at the beginning that, that failure is not fatal. 
And we see that in Psalm 51, that, that even though, though David had committed great sin, he understood that he was the one that, that caused his own problems here. He realized he was the one responsible. He, he appealed to God, the only source that he had for forgiveness. And then he said, because I know I'm getting it, I'm going to serve you that much more and with that much more strength. How could God forgive me? You know, there's a story in Ernest Gordon's uh, book, Miracle on the River Kwai. It talks about, maybe you've seen the movie, but the, uh, if you've read the book, you remember the point in the movie were, or the book rather, were that the Scottish soldiers, because they had been so brutally treated by their Japanese uh, torturers in this camp, as they were working on this railroad for them, they, they got to the point they were acting... He says savagely, like beasts. He didn't care about anybody but themselves. It was just get the job done and move on. Until one day, as they were lined up about to leave the work site and go back to camp, one of the, the commanders of the Japanese outfit that was, that was uh, their, their jailers accused them of, of someone hiding or losing a shovel. He said, we've counted the shovels and there's one missing. Who lost the shovel? Who stole the shovel? None of the Scottish soldiers stepped up. And so they lined them up, and they had all of the Japanese there, had their guns. They were fixing to mow them down. And finally, one man stepped forward and said, It was me. I did it. So he took the shovel that he had in his hand, and he beat him to death with that shovel. They lined them up and they marched them back to the camp. And when they got to the camp and got to the, the shed, they, they started counting the shovels as they put it in. And they realized there wasn't one missing. The Japanese soldiers had miscounted. That Scottish soldier that stepped forward and said, I did it, he was innocent. But he took the punishment for them. And because of his sacrifice, all of a sudden the soldiers grew closer to one another, these, these Scottish prisoners. And they began to, to, to help each other and to love each other and, and to show each other kindness that they never had before. And finally, whenever at the end of the war, when, when they were uh, down to skeletons, basically, the few that were remaining that hadn't been starved or, or worked to death, during their time as captors. When the victorious allies swept in. And they came to the camp. And they were there with their guns. About to shoot the Japanese. These Scottish soldiers lined up. In front of their prison holders. And said no more. What we need now is forgiveness. And in the book he says, sacrificial love has transforming power. Doesn't it? The fact that Jesus stood up as an innocent, the only innocent one who's ever lived on this earth. And said, I'll take the beating for Corey. Should transform our lives. How can God forgive us? Turn if you would to Psalm 103. Beginning in verse 11. Can God forgive me? Yes, He can. If we accept the fact and are ready to admit the fact that I make mistakes, it's my fault, no one else's. If we're willing to turn to Him and Him alone and ask Him to forgive us, and be willing to accept forgiveness on His terms, and if we're willing to live a life in service to Him. In Psalm 103, Beginning in verse 11, it says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear Him. For He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. See, God loves you. He loves you so much that He knew before He even created a being 
He knew before he ever breathed into man's nostril that first time life. He knew we were going to turn against him. He loved you so much that he said, no matter what they're seeing, I'm going to make a way for them back to me. Because that's how much he loves you. And that way was Jesus. And Jesus, God the Son, came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. He died on a cross for you and for me. And he says, if you'll come to me, and if you'll trust in me, and if you'll make me Lord of your life, if you'll follow the things that I've, I've said, my blood will wash away any sin that you have. Jason mentioned this morning, as he led us in our, our partaking of the Lord's Supper, the power of that blood, power to take away any sin. And it's there waiting for you. If you believe in Jesus, if you're willing to serve Him instead of self, if you confess your faith, that you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life before this number, you can be baptized, immersed into the watery grave of baptism to come into contact with that blood. And whatever sins you've committed, they may be washed away. Maybe as a child of God, you've done that, but you've, like David, have wandered away. Be a man of God. Be a woman of God. And, and accept His salvation, His forgiveness on His terms. Admit you've done wrong. Ask Him for forgiveness. Begin walking in the light once again. And that forgiveness will come. Back when I was in Weekly County preaching, there was a man that lived next door to the church building. Duck hunting with him. Good, as, good a man as you'd ever hope to know. But never could get him to come to church. And every time I'd ask him, Ray was his name, every time I'd ask Ray to come, he'd say, well, you know, Corey, I would, but if you knew what I'd done in my life, and I'd say, well, just, well, if I went to church, the roof would probably fall in. Have you heard that one before? Well, after years of begging and pleading and asking and inviting, one night he surprised me at a gospel meeting we had, and he showed up. And as he was coming out at the end of services, and I'm shaking everybody's hand, you know, you have to shake everybody out, shake his hand and, and tell him I was glad to see him and come back. And, yet, and when he gets almost past me, I, I kind of turned him around. I said, hey, Ray. That roof's still up there. And he grinned. And he came back the next night. And he came back the next night. And that night he was baptized in Christ. As about a 68 year old man. And the only time he did not come to services. Was when his cancer got so bad. He physically could not get up. And drag himself across the road. And it was a joy. As much as I miss him. It was a joy to preach the funeral of my brother in Christ that had all those sins forgiven. Whatever sins you've committed can be forgiven, but only through Jesus. Come to Him right now while we stand and while we sing.